My 1913 Bradshaw's Handbook to the Chief Cities of the World has brought me to Australia. I will ride some of the longest trains and the world's steepest railway. I'll climb blue mountains and cross red deserts. I'll swim above coral reefs and walk upon golden sands. As I journey across this spectacular continent, I'll discover the gold and silver, coal and wool on which this nation was built. I'll encounter her indigenous people and her national heroes and discover the origins of the millions of immigrants who now call themselves Australians. I'm embarking on a journey across the southeast of this vast continent, from the seat of government to the multi ethnic heart of its second largest city. Australia, like the USA, began its modern political life as a number of British colonies, but more like Canada, it achieved its independence without a revolution. And even to this day, its head of state is the British monarch. My Bradshaw's comments that the Commonwealth of Australia was constituted in 1900 by the Federation of New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, Queensland, Western Australia, and Tasmania, and was proclaimed at Sydney on the 1st of January, 1901. The new nation had been hewn by waves of hardy immigrants out of unforgiving terrain. Now it would demonstrate its robustness on the world stage, on the sporting field, and on the battlefields. I begin in the capital, Canberra, home to the nation's parliament. I'll cross into the state of Victoria, bound for Melbourne, where I'll encounter a famous outlaw and pay my respects at a cricketing shrine. I'll hit a high note in the suburb of Lilydale, then travel south to Belgrave and finish in Birigurra to explore the origins of Australia's oldest export. On my tour, I'll discover the cultural and sporting capital of Australia. This is a temple. This is holy ground. Have a close shave with the sheep. Getting me as a shearer, this poor ram has been fleeced. And ride the rails through a rainforest. Oh, wow, look at that. Canberra has an interesting geography. But from the ground level, it's quite difficult to figure out how it all fits together. So I'm going to use a technology which would have been highly familiar to the Bradshaw's traveller. Nobody should leave the ground and list them in the basket. So <laughs> if the wind wants to blow the envelope around, just let go, walk away. Our balloon is filling up with air, and I'm delighted to see that it is brightly coloured. Our pilot, Ewan Roberts, has been flying balloons over Canberra for 20 years. I'm in a large picnic basket with 350,000 cubic feet of air above me. Am I sane? Bye. Have a great flight. Thank you.
Looking down on this glorious setting, you can see why the city is known as the Bush Capital. What is so lovely about the balloon is its silence, unlike a helicopter, unlike a plane. People down there don't know we're looking at them. We are spying. Shauna, what do you think of it? Yeah, it's amazing. A really different perspective. It's beautiful. Very nice to be living campus. But this is the first time you've seen it like this? Yes, definitely like this. <laughs> I love the views. So not many people get that view of Parliament House. No. We've got the House of Representatives on the left-hand side, the Senate on the right-hand side. What is clear from up here is that Canberra was built to a master plan with enormous perspectives, a sort of Washington, a sort of Paris, but I think actually the distances are bigger. It took amazing imagination to build such a city in a wilderness. We're down. Oh, well done, sir. Shortly before my guidebook was published, the six colonies of Australia came together as one country. Power was divided between a central federal government and the governments of the six colonies, which were renamed states. I'm meeting historian Dr. David Heedon to find out how Canberra became the nation's capital. David, in this extraordinary location between the old parliament building and the new one, we come across this stone. So what was this commemorating? It was hugely important, Mike, and it was the end of arguably a 20-year process, and that was the foundation stones were laid on the 12th of March 1913 by the uh, fifth Governor-General, Lord Denman, along with the Australian Prime Minister, Andrew Fisher. And then Lady Denman um, had the honour to actually say the place would be called Canberra. The politicians were adamant they didn't know how to pronounce it. Was it Canberra or Canberra? And they decided, actually officially decided, however she pronounced it on the day, that would be the pronunciation. So I suspect she said Canberra, um, and, uh, and Canberra it has become with two syllables. Now, just stepping back, what was it that made the colonies of Australia want to federate and to become a commonwealth? Well, up to perhaps the early 1890s, they were not. Uh, there, was, there were great rivalries, especially between New South Wales, the so-called mother colony, and Victoria, which had made a lot of money through gold. But the closer we got to the new century, the more there was a sort of sense of momentum. Fierce competition between Sydney, the capital of New South Wales, and Melbourne, capital of Victoria, meant that neither would accept the other as a national capital. Eventually, agreement was reached to build a new city within New South Wales, but no less than 100 miles away from Sydney. When they were looking for places and they finally settled on this area, they loved the fact that there were pretty good rivers, which had trout, that was big. There was plenty of game for shooting, that was big. About three miles that way is a very small, beautiful church called St John's Church. It looked very much like a parish church in England. So the idea was that there was a sort of a very, very modest infrastructure for a coming city. In April 1911, the Commonwealth of Australia launched an international competition to design the nation's new capital. The winner was Chicago architect Walter Burley Griffin. Griffin's designs were rendered by architect Marion Marnie Griffin, whom he'd married that summer. He was inspired by the City Beautiful and Garden City movements. David has brought me to the National Archives of Australia to see the original blueprints for the city. There were 16 drawings, two of them panoramic, and the one that is best known is this particular one, which is the view from the summit of Mount Ainsley looking south. There it is, uh, in all its glory. It is magnificent, isn't it? It really is. And it's superb because you are looking at the absolute layout of the city. Things are broadly in place. For example, 
Walter and Marion were able to anticipate pretty much precisely what the lake would look like. This is clearly recognisable as the camera that I've seen today. This, this is Anzac Avenue. That's where the old parliament is. And actually, that's where the new parliament is. Uh, is that right? Absolutely. We certainly have the outline. The buildings are in different places. We finally got the lake um, in the late 1950s. But it is the most beautiful city in the landscape to the extent that you've got bush surrounding Canberra and indeed penetrating in the very best sense the suburbs. That is Griffin-esque, without a doubt. Parliament House was completed in 1927, and the Federal Parliament sat there until 1988, when Queen Elizabeth II opened new Parliament House. To me, as a former politician, any visit to a foreign parliament is intensely exciting. And when you see the House of Representatives here on television, with its robust rough and tumble, it's like Westminster with an Australian accent. But their building could not be more different. Parliament consists of two houses, the House of Representatives and the Senate. And the Queen is represented by the Governor-General. Deputy Speaker, time is running out. Under this out-of-touch Prime Minister, under this out-of-touch government, in just 10 days... Gay Brotman time, is a Member of Parliament representing Canberra for the opposition Australian Labour Party. Gay, Canberra is a very special kind of capital city. How does it work for this vast Commonwealth of Australia, do you think? Well, some Australians love to hate Canberra because it is the seat of government and they do see it as good or bad as a result of the government decisions. Uh, but once they actually come here, they realise that it is not just Parliament, it is so much more. Here is the soul of the nation at the Australian War Memorial. Here are uh, institutions telling their history. And this building, of course, was not designed by Griffin. But it's no. fascinating. I understand one of, the, one of the points is that the people were able to walk up the grassy slopes and be above the people that they'd elected. Is that right? Australians love the fact that they can walk on top of their pollies, but most importantly, that children can roll down the grass over their politicians. No, that's very nice. Now, what's Canberra like as a city for people living here? It's a city that was pretty beige for a very long time, but it, particularly in recent years, we've seen a huge surge in population, and it's a city that is diversifying and, as a result of that, becoming far more exciting. It's a bush capital. We love our big sky. Uh, we love all our green space. It's a lovely place to live. Do you mind me sharing a disappointment with you about Canberra? Oh, tell me. You don't have enough tracks, railway tracks. There's no metro. What's going on? It's coming. We now have the light rail being built at the moment and we're very much looking forward to it coming online. From the Australian Capital Territory, which lies within New South Wales, my journey will take me around 290 miles southwest into the neighbouring state of Victoria and its capital, Melbourne. This service travels north, where passengers for Melbourne pick up the high-speed XPT service, which runs all the way from Sydney. Pipe a car in car A towards the rear of the train. There's no open serving like refreshment. Hello. Um, would you have such a thing as an Australian beer, please? Yes. Thank you very much. Oh, I don't know, maybe a little snack? What have you got? Cheese and crackers. Cheese and crackers, perfect. Commonwealth of Australia. Melbourne had an auspicious start incorporated as a crown settlement in the year that Queen Victoria came to the throne and named after her first prime minister. Later, it would become capital of the state that bore her name. 
Bradshaws tells me that its population has reached 600,000 by 1911. It is the provisional capital of the Commonwealth of Australia, pending the completion of the new capital at Canberra, built on undulating ground at the head of a fine harbour and extending two miles along the Yarra River. Its phenomenal growth and prosperity can be put down to the discovery of gold and the waves of immigration that followed. Melbourne is Australia's second largest metropolis. Southern Cross Station is the city's rail hub and dates back to 1859. A 400 million pound refurbishment has turned it into a thoroughly modern terminus. I'm looking forward to getting to know the city in the morning. Melbourne is home to almost 5 million people and sits at the head of Port Phillip Bay on Australia's southeastern coast. The city was founded in 1835, nearly 50 years after Sydney, but unlike its great rival, it was populated by free settlers rather than convicts. When the colony of Victoria separated from New South Wales, Melbourne became its capital. This magnificent neoclassical building is the State Parliament of Victoria. And at the time of my guidebook, it was also provisionally where the Federal Parliament of the new Commonwealth of Australia sat. And what this building tells me is that even in colonial times, Melbourne saw itself as one of the outstanding cities of the British Empire. I feel pretty at home in Melbourne because of the large number of older buildings of British style. And then it's as though someone had come along and grafted onto that a modern downtown of American style skyscrapers. But it's as though the graft hasn't taken. The place still feels really European. Melbournians love to eat out. And this city is said to have more restaurants and cafes per head than anywhere else in the world. They are serious coffee connoisseurs. Hello. Um, could I have a frothy cappuccino, please? Thank you very much. Even in uh, Bradshaw's day, Melbourne was famous for fine coffee palaces. But after World War II, waves of emigration from Italy coincided with an Australian wish to attract a larger population. And that gave Melbourne a coffee culture, which some claim is the greatest in the world. They tend to favour local names and cafes and spurn multinationals. Excuse me. Oh, hi. Do, do you live in Melbourne? I do, yes. Is it true, do you think, that Melbourne has a real coffee culture? Uh, I would say undoubtedly it does. I'd say arguably some of the best coffee in the world. I suppose, like everything else, there will, would also be rivalry with Sydney in this weekend. Uh, I wouldn't say that there is any competition with Sydney. It's all about Melbourne. <laughs> This city prides itself on its vibrant culture, with some of Australia's best galleries and museums. It's famous for its laneways, a network of over 40 back streets that crisscross the city centre. Imagine these narrow laneways at the time of my guidebook. Stinky, rat-infested, 
full of vice, slums that had to be cleared away. Thank goodness not all were demolished, and some now serve as galleries, their walls covered in spontaneous art. Hello, guys. Excuse me. Hi. Are you a tourist in Melbourne? Oh, yeah. Yes, I am. You're a tourist too yes, in Melbourne? So you come to the laneways. What do you think of this art? I think it's beautiful. Yeah? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's pretty, pretty beautiful. Cool. Why do you find it beautiful? I mean, some people would just say that's graffiti. Yeah. No, it's art. It looks so cool when you, it's a great background when you do photos. Did you take some? Yeah. May I see them? Yeah. Wow, you it's took beautiful. a lot. This one is so cool. That one is cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. I think you've made it look more arty than it really is. Well done. Yeah. It is art. It is art, OK. I'm taking the metro three stops east to the neighbourhood of Jollibond, home to an Australian sporting icon. There are 5,500 acres of parks and gardens in Melbourne and its suburbs. So wrote Bradshaw's in 1913, and even today the city is full of green spaces where Melbournians can practice their sporting skills. The Melbourne Cricket Ground was established here in Yarra Park in 1853 and has now grown into an immense stadium capable of holding more than 100,000 spectators. So that even when an Australian batsman is facing an English bowler, it is difficult for him to knock the ball out of the park. Known locally simply as the G, this is Australia's largest sports stadium and one of the world's most famous arenas. Even I, not particularly interested in cricket, am overwhelmed by entering this vast bowl so often filled with baying Australian fans countered by the English guerrilla Barmy Army. This is a temple of cricket. This is holy ground. David Studham is the Melbourne Cricket Club's librarian at the MCG and an ardent fan. Hello, David. I'm Michael. Hi, Michael. Welcome. Well, thank you. This is an extraordinary place. There was first a Melbourne cricket ground in 1853, is that right? Uh, there was a prior ground prior to that, and we moved here because of the impact of the gold rush. Uh, you had an itinerant village set up next to our original ground, so you had pestilence, disease, crime. The Yarra River used to flood, so they decided, let's get out of town, and they came to the sticks, as it was then, to this location, and we're very fortunate that 160 odd years ago they came here because it's so central now for Melbourne. What does this stadium mean to you? Well, very much it's the heart and soul of Melbourne. People come here to celebrate, to mourn, um, to play, and it really fills that role of the medieval cathedral in, in the life of a city uh, because this is where we come to, to worship in, in uh, the great loves of Australian sport. Here, the MCC Library has catalogued the history of Australian cricket, including the beginnings of its most heated battle. When does cricket begin in Australia? 1803, up in Sydney, and it spreads throughout the colonies. And the Melbourne Cricket Club is formed in 1838. When do Australians start playing as Australia? Well, well before Federation. It's 1877. 
1877. Yes, you get the cricketers from New South Wales and Victoria coming together to play as Australians against England here in the very first test in March 1877. And does that have a political impact then, the fact that Australians are playing as a country? Very much so. We had the fourth test here in 1898. The politicians all came down from Parliament House here to the ground and they watched Australia play England. They're trying to get a country together debating up at the Parliament House and they come and watch a country on the field. It has a big impact on their thinking. How does the ashes begin? That goes back to Australia defeating England for the first time on English soil in 1882 at the Oval in London. People were quite shocked that the colonials had beaten the home country and there were two obituaries to English cricket. <laughs> One published here in Cricket, a weekly record of the game on the 31st of August, a couple of days after the match. Then two days later, you get this obituary here, in affectionate remembrance of English cricket, which died at the Oval. And you've got the note at the bottom, the body will be cremated and the ashes taken to Australia. And that's the origin? That's the origin. There's an England team that comes out immediately after and they come out and say, we're here to win back the ashes of English cricket. What role do you think cricket has played in the cementing of your nation? It made Australians you know, proud of themselves on the sporting field. It's bound the colonies together and into nationhood in that way, undoubtedly. As luck would have it, there's a match here tonight, and I've managed to get a ticket. Summer's evening at the MCG. It's the last international fixture this year. And it is Australia versus England in the 2020. Just not England's year. This morning, just a short walk from the central business district. I've come to see a much-loved Melbourne landmark. Queen Victoria Market opened 140 years ago. Today, its variety of foods and aromas reflects the rich, multi-ethnic makeup of this city. Do you mind me asking, where are you from originally? Vietnam. Vietnam? Yes. How long has your family been in Australia? 30 years. Hello, sir. Where's your family from, sir? Iran. Iran? Hello. Hello. Uh, tell me, where is your family from originally? Originally, Italy. How many generations have you been in Australia now? Two. Two. And has your family loved Australia? Yes. The growth of Victoria, says Bradshaws, has been very rapid. The population rose from 77,000 in 1851 to 627,000 in 1865, one half of whom were employed in the gold fields. The sudden discovery of ore having attracted immigrants from all parts. Now, since the Second World War, the Australian economy has grown and it now penetrates markets all over the world. And the population required to sustain that resembles a fruit salad of humanity. Around 40% of Greater Melbourne's population was born overseas, and over 140 cultures are represented here. But Australia hasn't always been as welcoming. Hello, Joy. Hello, Michael. Lovely to meet you. Joy de Moussi is a history professor at the University of Melbourne. In the mid-19th century, you've got a gold rush, and then for the rest of the century, a lot of immigration. Where are these people coming from? Well, they're coming from all across the world. Uh, every country in Europe, uh, from the US, from the UK, uh, and from, of course, the Asia region. 
And in the 19th century, how does Australia feel about all these immigrants? Well, unfortunately, it's a culture, if you recall, at that time where uh, British society is seen as the ideal and br uh, Britishness and whiteness, of course. And what's meant by white? Um, I mean, obviously not Asian or, or black, but I mean, does it apply to Southern Europeans in some way? Well, indeed it did in, in, in some places. Yes, it did. Uh, so my heritage, which is Greek, uh, there were attitudes around the Greek and Italian um, cultures, which was dictated by notions of whiteness. There's discomfort because uh, many of these cultures do not conform to a sort of British European white ideal. The whiter the better. Uh, the whiter the better, the absolute whiter the better. And you see this later, later on as well. It's a constant throughout Australian history. So in 1901, the Commonwealth of Australia is founded. What is its immigration policy? The White Australia policy is introduced as a formal policy of the Australian government, and that restricts immigration to uh, communities and cultures that are d identified as white. There was a dictation test. Was that a difficult test? Oh, it was impossible, and it was intentionally difficult, so it could curtail the number of people who would uh, successfully enter the country. The policy ensured that Australia, until the middle of the 20th century, maintained its predominantly British and Irish makeup. But after the Second World War, the government declared that to defend the country and to develop the economy, Australia must, as the slogan declared, populate or perish. There is a massive migration policy to encourage migrants to come to Australia. So the favoured migrants are from Scandinavia, initially. The problem is, there were not enough numbers of people wanting to come from Scandinavian countries. So the Australian government was, was forced to um, bring in migrants from Italy and Greece, like my, my parents. Although Australia opened its doors to more immigrants in the 50s and 60s, it wasn't until 1973 that the white Australia policy was finally dismantled. What do you think Australians feel generally about being multi-ethnic? Oh, I think Australians feel very positive about being multi-ethnic um, and increasingly so. It's just extraordinary and very striking that it's migration and ethnicity and, and multiculturalism that makes it, this country so fantastic and is such... I'm heading just south of the city to St Kilda, on the heels of the most notorious outlaw of the region, indeed of all Australia, Ned Kelly. At the time of my Bradshaw's Guide, a feature film had already made him famous around the globe. At the historic Astor Cinema, author and historical guide Trevor Pultney has arranged a private screening for me. Hello, Trevor. Michael. In a wonderfully preserved cinema, what film are we going to be treated to? Well, we're going to see the story of the Kelly Gang, made in 1906. A bunch of bushrangers here in Victoria, outlaws, led by Ned Kelly, who played havoc for 18 months. What do we mean by bushranger? Bandit, I suppose. Um, outlaw. They robbed stagecoaches. They stole horses. There's, there's a word in this part of the, of the world that uh, describes someone like Ned Kelly, and that word's larrikin, a likeable rogue. Ned Kelly was born into a poor Irish farming family in Beveridge, to the north of Melbourne, in 1855. His father was a convict, and by the age of 14, Ned, too, was in trouble with the law. This film dramatises the Kelly gang's exploits, and Ned's last battle with the police. It was a huge hit in Australia and in Britain, and was the first feature-length movie in the world. The gang's in the bush, I suppose. The, the gang's in the bush after beating up the, the policeman. Why would the bush rangers uh, have any heroic status, at least a part of the public? Well, you've, you've got the the romantic sort of uh, anti-authoritarianism, which uh, is a big thing in this part of the world. Hmm. And uh, the Kellys in particular 
um, it was perceived that they were treated badly by, by the authorities who got poor quality land and uh, didn't have the uh, opportunity to uh, better themselves. Kelly was eventually captured after a shootout in the country town of Glenrowan, 150 miles east of Melbourne. Safe from death by his homemade armour, he was locked in the city jail, now preserved as a museum. Do you think Kelly got a fair trial? No, I don't. Things were stacked against him. He was tried here in Melbourne and not where the crimes took place. But they weren't going to get a guilty verdict there. And the people in the northeast, his, his land, admired Ned. For example, if you've got someone savvy enough to burn the mortgage documents when he opens the, the safe of a bank, uh, you've got a lot of allies on your side. Here in Melbourne, they got their information from the newspapers. And where did he meet his end? Right there. A jury took just half an hour to find Kelly guilty of murder. He was hanged here in November 1880, aged 25. Why is it, do you think, that a man who was guilty of murder and of uh, robberies and so on plays an important part in Australian culture? He embodied that feeling of the, the small man against the establishment for many people. And does Ned Kelly still defy Australian people? Oh, he certainly does. Um, amongst the people I talk to here in the jail, it's about 50-50. Half the people here think Ned was a, a poor, misunderstood guy, nice fellow, um, went a little bit wrong, but by and large, rather heroic. The other half think he was a dirty, rotten, murdering scoundrel. St Kilda is home to Melbourne's number one beach. At the time of my guidebook, Australia's first theme park had just opened here, and the star attraction was its great scenic railway. All roller coasters are terrifying to me, but there's a particular frisson to this one, which is that we rely on Matt, our brake man. There are seven places where the railway goes flat, and he has to make sure that we don't go too fast. I hope he's feeling really good today. Ah. This morning I'm leaving the big city behind and taking a local train from Flinders Street Station to the suburb of Lilydale. From there I'll travel to Belgrave before making my final journey southwest across rural Victoria to the town of Birigara. A nation's banknotes tell you a lot about its heroes. This is the $100 bill commemorating a truly great Australian who won global acclaim, not with a bat or ball, but in the more niche area of classical music, nonetheless attracting adoring crowds whenever in Sydney or Melbourne. The achievement was all the more remarkable because she was a woman and an outspoken one at that. Taking her stage name from her home city, this is the idolized 
Dame Nellie Melba. I'm curious to know whether she's still popular with Australians today. Excuse me. Oh, my God, it's you, Michael. How <laughs> glorious to see you. Thank you very the much. The last time I saw you, you were on the telly. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dame Nellie Melba. Ah, uh, now there's a woman. Yes, tell me. Is she a heroine of yours? Well, she is. Not only because she had such a remarkable voice, but she had an interest in the common people. What did she achieve for Australia? Well, she was prepared to travel overseas and calling herself Melba, I thought, was, um, you know, that was unique and remarkable so long ago to put Australia and Melbourne on the map like that. Four miles north of Lilydale lies Coombe Cottage. Built in 1912, it was a labour of love for Dame Nellie. In seven acres of splendid gardens, she would entertain stars such as Charlie Chaplin and Douglas Fairbanks. Still owned by her family, private functions are now held here, and estate manager Daniel Johnson has invited me for a personal tour of the cottage. Nellie Melba's bedroom, I take it. <laughs> Indeed. Who was Nellie Melba? Uh, well, born Helen Porter Mitchell. She was the daughter of David Mitchell, who was a stonemason from Forfar in Scotland. Uh, he came out here in about 1852. Uh, and from an early age, Melba was very musical. She wanted to become a singer. After training in Melbourne in her early 20s, Nellie studied in Paris before making her opera debut in Brussels in 1887. In her 40 years as a diva, she sang at the world's great opera houses, gaining global acclaim and eminent admirers. There's a, a lovely letter from Buckingham Palace. What's quite interesting about this is that she wasn't just um, friends with the royals in the sense that they were coming to see her perform. They were also actually popping around for a cup of tea. So when you look at the visitors' books, you see Albert or George. From a, a girl from the colonies, I think, is quite a remarkable story. Once established as a soprano superstar, Nellie used her fame to raise money for the war effort. And in 1918, she was made a dame of the British Empire. She was certainly, by all accounts, uh, quite fun, uh, quite free-spirited, uh, as well as being a great perfectionist. So she's really shaken up society at that time when uh, women are used to sort of sitting on their hands and being seen and not heard. She's there front and centre. Dame Nellie Melba died in Sydney in 1931. Her body was brought to Melbourne on a special train, her coffin draped in the Australian flag. I think you can tell by the size of the cortege, the amount of people that turned out on the streets, that there was uh, a deep-seated affection for her throughout all levels uh, of society in Australia. Dame Nellie's best-known songs are still performed here in her music room. Today by Cleo Lee McGowan. Like 
not a dry eye in the theatre, Cleo. That was absolutely marvellous. Tom, thank you so much. Among Nelly's many fans was the celebrated French chef, Georges-Auguste Escoffier. Whilst working at London Savoy Hotel, he's said to have watched her perform at Covent Garden Opera House and been inspired to create a dessert in her honour. The Peach Melba became a classic, still popular here at the Estates Restaurant. Neil, that yeah. looks lovely. Uh, have a seat. Thank you. Peach, I see. Raspberries, I see. What else? Uh, peach puree, uh, raspberry coulis. Um, this is the raspberry bavoir and the vanilla bavoir. And is that a classic peach melba? No, that's my interpretation of the peach melba, yeah. Very, very good. This will be the prima donna of desserts. No, thank you. Enjoy. Start with a little peach. Excellent, as you'd imagine in Australia. And add a little melba. Mmm. It's really nice. Thank I feel. You. I feel like bursting into song, <laughs> but I'll be kind Please. and I won't. <laughs> Fifteen miles south of Lilydale in Belgrave, I'm told there's a heritage train that I simply have to ride. Hello, you look wonderful. Thank you, you look pretty spiffy yourself. Thank you. This is the Puffing Billy Railway. It was built in 1900 and runs for 18 miles through the temperate rainforest of the Dandenong Mountains. This is the first time I've ridden on a train with my legs sticking out. Unfortunately, this solid wooden bar on which I'm sitting is not exactly upholstered, although I have brought a little of my own. In 1953, a landslide forced the line to close. But 20 years ago, it was completely restored by volunteers. Across the spectacular Trestle Bridge. Oh, wow, look at that. First time on Puffing Billy? Oh no, no, we've been on many times. Yep, my son loves it. We live locally and he loves to volunteer up at the trains. What, what do you do on the trains? Um, we just uh, clean the railways and uh, polish trains uh, and sheds. You polish them? Yeah. Really? Uh, do you have an ambition to go into the railways as a job? Yeah. What would you like to do? Drive a train. You'd like to drive a train? Yeah. Is there something special about Puffy Billy? It just brings you close to nature. It does, doesn't it? Jeff Goodwin is a volunteer and president of the Puffing Billy Society. Jeff, it's a pretty railway, it goes uphill, but where is it going to? Why was it built? This was one of four narrow gauge railways built at the end of the 19th century. And they were built really to open up areas of Victoria that were otherwise inaccessible. And that's a hell of an Australian accent you've got there. <laughs> well, I'm from Stockport originally. I've been in Australia 20 years. I've been with Puffing Billy for 20 years. How many volunteers have you got? We've got about a thousand. A thousand? A thousand volunteers. It's like an army. It is. In the last six years, we've doubled our passenger figures. We've gone from about 250,000 passengers a year 
to now just over 500,000. Congratulations. It's a lovely ride. The final leg of this journey will take me 80 miles west of Melbourne into rural Victoria. To explore the origins of what was, at the time of my guidebook, Australia's preeminent industry. Sheep, says Bradshaws, now one of the chief products of Australia, were introduced in 1797 with a parent stock of three rams and five ewes. In 1910, the value of the output was 32 million pounds. For two centuries, the economy of this country has ridden on the sheep's back. And for Australia, it's difficult to overstate wool's sheer value. Australia is still the largest exporter of wool in the world. I'm going to visit a family that for six generations has been rearing sheep. Hello, Tom. Michael, g'day, welcome. Good How are you to doing? see you. Thank you very Looks much. like your house has been here a while. It sure has. The house has been here since 1840s. Tom Dennis and his family run Tandy Heritage Sheep Farm, one of the oldest in Victoria. Oh, really fine, a sort of a huge Victorian era dining room. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and one of the nice things about it is all of these people here have sat around this table over the, over the years. So Your ancestors. They are indeed, yeah. So Emma and Alexander Dennis, who left from uh, just out of Penzance in Cornwall in 1840 to set up life here in Australia. And then he and his two brothers decided to go, you know what, we're going to go and explore the new world in Australia. And then each of these consequent generations have been here on the farm. Remarkable. What a, what a spirit of adventure. It is, yeah. Uh, I mean, everybody kind of knows that huge Australian wealth was built on wool. Mm. But has it all been plain sailing? There was a boom time in the 1870s, mm. um, and that continued up until the 1890s. Uh, but then there's the, the, the slumps afterwards. And so this guy here, number three, I think he deserves so much respect because his dad like lived it up, had the high life. And then he uh, came in with a whole lot of debt, uh, centennial drought, World War I, the depression, World War II. And at the end of World War II, in 1944, there was a bushfire that came in for them from the north and uh, everything was wiped out. Luckily, he, one of his sons was having a party in this very room. He was about to go off to war, so it was a farewell party. And, uh, and everybody was put to task to uh, put out the fire, save the place. And luckily, we're still here today because of it. What an extraordinary story. Uh, I mean, it's part of the story of Australia told in a single family, isn't it? It, it is unusual, yeah. So ancestors and sheep. Would it be all right if I meet your co-workers? Absolutely, I'd love you to meet them. The farm's 900-strong flock grazes 500 acres. Once a year, the sheep are brought in to be shorn. So, Michael, we're going to meet a few people just now. We've got Gemma. Gemma. Nice to meet you, Michael. Michael. We've got Gary over here, who's shearing. Hello, Gary. This is my brother, Al. Hello, Al. Michael, Good to going? see you all. So, Gary's going to pull out one of our Polworth rams. With 30 years' experience under his belt, Gary Learson can strip an entire fleece in three minutes. I've seen sheep shearing before on television and the skill of it is absolutely amazing. But to see it close up and the quantity 
of the wool is just extraordinary. Gemma, what, what are you doing? So that process is called skirting. The edges of a fleece have what we call frib on them, so it's a combination of dirt and sweat. Right. So we take the frib off. What does the fleece weigh? Shall we weigh it? No, oh, yeah, let's weigh it. So that's an average size fleece at three and a half kilos. Three and a half <laughs> kilos is quite a heavy coat to be it carrying is, around. It is a heavy coat. Under Gary's watchful eye, I'm encouraged to have a go. On, on the head? Yeah. Like that? Yep. And I'm going along the back here. Yep. And along we go. Yep. Up towards here. OK. Of course, I'm scared because I'm worried about hurting yeah. the sheep. Oh, there we are. That's got it. <laughs> And along here. Yes, yes, yes. Getting me as a shearer, this poor ram has been fleeced. Oh, stupid. OK. Stupid together. Come back. Is that it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's not too bad, actually. It's pretty yeah. good. There's been a lot worse yeah. ones. Hey, well done. That's fantastic. <laughs> Very good. You nailed it. Like the USA, Australia experienced a gold rush which attracted massive immigration. Still, despite their diversity, Australians developed a distinct national culture, and cricket was both a unifying force and an ambassador to the world. The new federation didn't want to be known for its old penal colonies or bush rangers, nor just for its sheep shearers. And Dame Nellie Melba created a cultured impression of Australia abroad. Like the USA and using an American architect, the new nation designed a remarkable capital, a city beautiful, which would attract the world's admiration. Next time, I get my hands on the controls of the Sugarcane Express. The horn is a warning to Aussies. Pom at the controls. Sing along at the billabong. You'll come a waltzing Matilda with me. And discover many fish in the sea. I've seen many of the wonders of nature before, but nothing, I think, that struck me with such a sense of magnificence. Do we associate Robinson Crusoe with colonialism, Jane Eyre with slavery? What was true and what was false? Novels that shaped our world in an hour. Prince Andrew and the Epstein scandal, the Newsnight interview, is next. <laughs>